Hello, everyone, and welcome to another DevOps.com webinar. Thank you for joining us. Today, we have an interesting webinar with OpenMake and GitHub. They're going to be talking a little bit about the application package from GitHub repository called Deploy Hub. And they're going to show you exactly how to do it, how to deploy it, and get it done. On that note, let me introduce you to both Tracy from OpenMake and Christian from GitHub. Christian, are you there? I am. Thank you. Uh, you want to take over? Yeah, I sure can. Thank you so much. Okay. Chris, are you there, Christian? I am. Are you? Uh, are we ready? We're ready. Take it from here. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, so thank you, uh, guys, for everyone that's joining on uh, this webinar this afternoon. I uh, just wanted to give you a quick introduction uh, to myself. Uh, my name is Christian Weber. I'm a solutions architect at GitHub. I've been with GitHub for about two and a half years now. And uh, my previous experience, I spent the last uh, six years prior to GitHub in financial services. I have done everything from release automation, release engineering, release management, uh, to uh, various levels of level one through level three support and have really seen uh, a, a lot of ways. Uh, I've really seen the evolution of software development into uh, where we're seeing with DevOps today. So uh, really what I, I want to cover with myself and Tracy is how we can leverage uh, an automated process with software delivery into a tool with OpenMake as well. Um, there's a lot that we can cover in this conversation, but really what I want to drive home today is uh, the spirit of collaboration among software developers and using tools like OpenMake to automate uh, the delivery process as quickly as possible. So with that, I want to go ahead and uh, have maybe Tracy introduce herself, and then we'll go ahead and get into the discussion. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Tracy Reagan, CEO of OpenMake Software. Uh, what we're talking about today will be a product that um, is now known as Deploy Hub. And its, uh, its specialty is being driven by the CD process to do continuous deployments. We often hear that continuous deployment is the sort of the unicorn. Well, we, we think that you can, uh, you, can, you can leash the unicorn and put it to work for you. And that's what continuous deployment's all, all about. We'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges, but I want everybody to, to understand that Application release automation does not have to be expensive. Deploy Hub is open source. So what we're going to show you today, you can actually get started with at no cost to you. And Christian, I'll turn it back to you. Perfect. And uh, for those on the webinar, uh, Tracy will be my uh, uh, guide with the slides. So you may hear me say next slide. Uh, so that's mm -hmm. what that is. So as Tracy was talking about, you know, essentially what we're, what we're thinking about here is uh, software development from two sides, right? We're thinking about release automation and release management, but we're also thinking about uh, a GitHub as a software development platform that can sort of link this whole process together. So when we think about traditional uh, software development life cycles, um, you know, one of the last pieces that's really to be solved in this process is the idea of how we can sort of uh, manage continuous deployment. We've done um, a really great job of managing a software development pipeline up until the continuous integration point. But up, up until now, there really hasn't been a lot of great tools that really can handle sort of release management and sort of the next step from there as well. So when we talk about teams that want to be agile or they, they want to sort of accelerate the release cycles, essentially we need an end-to-end -end pipeline that can give it, get us all the way from development uh, to production. And so when we think about those, the, that, that tooling, um, what that will enable us to do is to bring us into a cycle of innovation. Tracy, next slide. Perfect. And, and what I mean by that is we need to get into a mindset where we are moving away from ideas like uh, uh, long running branches and, and, and uh, long running releases and get into more of an iterative approach regarding our software development practice. And what I mean by that is that our change sets need to become smaller and smaller uh, because when we do something like that, then we can actually start uh, uh, making more rapid changes uh, 
to our, our product. Just as, a, an as, as an aside, we do this internally at GitHub, and this allows us to release to production 15, uh, 15 to 20 times a day to github.com. And the way we do that is through this uh, sort of process that you see on the screen. So as we're walking through this, I'm going to focus more on the GitHub side of this, which is our uh, sort of continuous uh, uh, integration into our code. And then you'll see on the right-hand side that we're actually moving into Deploy Hub to manage our shipped code as well. Um, this sort of cycle, again, produces uh, innovation and produces uh, a, a more empowered uh, developer. Um, because what we're really trying to do at GitHub is we're trying to change the context of how software development is done. Tracy, next slide. And what I mean by changing the context of the conversation is that we want to uh, build more communities within software development organizations uh, to change that context. When we think about traditional software development practices, a lot of times uh, traditional software shops have written software in silos. They've written very regimented, very isolated pieces of software that may relate to a bigger picture. But a lot of times software development teams and organizations are not necessarily on uh, board with our, our not necessarily given the information as to what the bigger picture is. So when we think about a platform like GitHub to enable that, I think one of our case studies with one of our enterprise customers, SAP, really shows that. Uh, what we're doing is we're breaking down internal silos within software development organizations. We're increasing transparency. And uh, with this whole process where we move into a shift left mentality, uh, we are now exposing all of that, uh, all of those changes within the scope of that organization to all those developers. Um, this again uh, kind of moves into a concept of what we like to call intersourcing uh, with our within organizations, in that we take the practices and methodologies that have uh, enabled the open source software development community community to succeed with large distributed projects and start applying that behind our firewall. So what I mean by that is that we do things like uh, uh, move into a, a method of being open by default, meaning that if I'm a member of an organization within my GitHub instance, uh, unless there are specific legal or compliance reasons that prevent me seeing that code, repository should be open uh, for everyone to innovate and work on uh, from there as well. Uh, Tracy, next slide. Because when we start doing uh, that uh, in terms of building that transparency and that visibility into that pipeline, uh, what we can see through independent study is that this actually reduces developer churn and increases visibility. So I'm not sure if uh, a lot of you are familiar with uh, Git Prime, but essentially they are a Git-based uh, research uh, uh, organization that does a lot of metrics and a lot of uh, software based on Git itself. And they found that uh, Developers that have gone to GitHub from other legacy systems, uh, on average, uh, reduce code churn by at least 12%, depending on the organization. So we can already see that uh, from, a, from a metric standpoint, there's already a tangible benefit by developers moving into this mindset. And when we start reducing that amount of churn, uh, we do two things. One, we uh, reduce the amount of work that a developer has to do. And we're also decreasing code uh, deduplication as well. I can tell you firsthand uh, that from a, in a previous life when I worked at a, a, a financial services firm, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we had as our own organization uh, was really uh, that code deduplication effort because we had a lot of isolated teams that didn't necessarily know what everyone was working on. And there were at least two projects that I worked on personally where uh, had I known what the rest of the organization was working on, we would have been able to, uh, we would have been able to uh, increase that as well. So now I, I want to kind of maybe shift the conversation a little bit and, and kind of show you what this actually looks like on our platform because when we talk about the platform, um, we're not necessarily focusing on individual features, right? Uh, we believe that the GitHub platform, uh, based on all the, the small things that make up it, really uh, accelerates software developers to work better together. So when I talk about that, it's things like uh, our uh, issues, right? Our, our lightweight issue tracker that allows uh, developers to uh, increase uh, visibility. Uh, they don't have to necessarily switch context into other platforms. They have everything right here. Uh, and Tracy, if I could have you hit the next uh, slide. 
or the next transition. Yeah. So things like uh, guidelines, right? Um, when we think about legacy version control tools, uh, you don't necessarily have like a really nice platform that kind of gives you, uh, that helps you sort of lead the way and lead breadcrumbs on how you want to do this. So one of the most important, I think, things, I, I think when we're looking at the scope of a repository on GitHub is the guidelines and the contributing guidelines that developers and users of that repository can see from there as well. Uh, next slide. Thing, uh, other little things uh, like labeling that allows us to tag those to milestones, which then we can cut from releases, uh, really allow developers to not only uh, organize efficiently, but also allows new developers to uh, really organize and see what they can contribute on. A very common use case uh, with developers that are using GitHub for the first time is that they'll go into a repository organized by the labels and look for labels like uh, uh, easy to fix or first time contributor because they can see what kind of issues that they can fix on there as well. Uh, Tracy, next slide. And then we move into the idea of the pull request. Now, one of the most important things that I think when we think about the pull request is that we're uh, one, uh, you know, putting version control on all of our code. But the second thing that the pull request does is it encourages and exposes collaboration across the entire team. So this is uh, an actual uh, pull request that's on the GitHub slash GitHub uh, that is currently open. Uh, so we're fixing a nice little bug within one of the PR edit titles. And you can see that, uh, you know, we have, uh, uh, we have developers that are collaborating on the code as close to the code as possible. Because when we think about, uh, traditional software development, a lot of times our change requests and our conversations around our code are happening in disparate, disconnected systems that don't necessarily allow for the context to be uh, uh, shown in the future. So if I was to look at this uh, uh, PR six months from now, because I have that conversation right there, uh, I can certainly understand the context of maybe why this code was changed or how it evolved over time. The second part of this and going into where Tracy's going to take over is the security and the continuous integration that's built into this process as well. So even if I have an approved pull request, as I have right here, and all of my CI has passed, uh, we build this all into our pull request and we can certainly allow for any level of granularity on there as well. Uh, Tracy, next slide. Because then we're also going to build in the idea of code security. So even if, uh, you know, all of our CI checks pass and all of our uh, collaboration, all of our approvers have approved it, we can still do things like code security to prevent code from being merged until we're absolutely ready. And I think that really ties into uh, this whole process on how we want to uh, build an automated pipeline and then integrating into tools like OpenMake and DeployHub that will uh, integrate this process and accelerate it even further. We at GitHub know that we do uh, you know, one thing really well, which is, uh, or two things really well, it's source code management and code collaboration. We then work with our integration partners like DeployHub that can really uh, take this to the next step. And with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and hand this over to Tracy, who's going to uh, lead the rest of the conversation today. Yeah, Tracy, this is Parker. Let me interrupt you for one second. Everyone, just to let you know, we're going to have a question and answer period at the end. And this webinar will be available for viewing on DevOps.com after the webinar if you choose to view it again. Tracy, it's all yours. Okay, uh, Deb, we have our first polling question. 45% of Fortune 100 companies use GitHub Enterprise. Are you a GitHub Enterprise user? Yeah, I think this was uh, one of the most interesting things I learned when I joined GitHub. You know, when I when I first joined GitHub about two and a half years ago, while everyone's polling, um, I didn't even realize we had an enterprise on-prem product. And uh, as it's evolved, you know, uh, it, it's really great to see all of these, uh, you know, all of our uh, all of our users that use on-prem as well. So it looks like we've got a good uh, good mix. Sixty-one percent are not GitHub enterprise users, but thirty-nine percent are. So that almost matches. Uh, where we're at in the Fortune 100 as well. Okay. Okay, so um, we're going to continue this conversation on from where Christian left off. We're going to talk a little bit about the pipeline and where most of you uh, may be. Uh, some of you maybe have a more mature pipeline, but for the most part, what we see is a process where you have uh, 
some level of workflows, maybe uh, ran by Jenkins or even built into um, GitHub, whereby you have a process for dev, a process for, for a testing environment, and hopefully you can get it to production. Uh, and what we, we see oftentimes is there's a lot of automation being built around the pipeline, but when it comes to the package and deploy process, it's scripted. And for good reason, because these tools can be extremely pricey and way over a project team's budget. But what that eventually will do is create a barrier to getting to production because scripted deployments um, can be a bit tricky to manage across the pipeline. They have to adapt. They have to change on the uh, based on the environment. And that's really what release automation solutions are intended to do. Again, uh, uh, what we see is the barrier to getting there is the cost of these tools. And so what happens is each environment scripts um, their own process. And sometimes dev will script for, for QA, but it, for the most part, it gets staged. And, and the production team makes the decisions at some later point when that, when that code gets moved all the way to the prod state. It's not necessarily automated or pushed in a continuous delivery fashion. Part of the reason too is a trust factor. Um, production teams like to write their own scripts just as developers like to write their own scripts and sometimes testing. So what occurs is that uh, a production team looks at the development code as um, something they can't maintain and so they choose to write their own. So there's a trust issue uh, in, the, in the overall process. And what we're really trying to get to is a mature loop. One that um, information can be shared across the pipeline. And as uh, Christian pointed out, we want to shift left. So more of the responsibility for doing deployments need to be in the hands of the developers, because quite honestly, it's the developers who know the most about their application, and they have the most to lose if something goes wrong. And in reality, for years now, we have had developers helping production teams get their production scripts to work. So we really are trying to build a loop. Uh, and we're going to show you basically today how you can do that. So let's just get another poll here. Um, you know, how mature is your continuous delivery model? Are you in one of these categories where each environment owner scripts their own uh, deployment practice? or where you're a CICD manages scripted deployments uh, from dev to test. And uh, the third option is, are you using a, a full release automation solution? Deb, I'll let you go ahead and open that poll. I don't know why it does that. Results are in. Okay, I can't see them. Deb, is there anything interesting there you wanna talk about? Uh, forty-four percent say each environment owner scripts their own deployment process. Followed closely at thirty-one percent with CI/CD manages scripted deployments, and twenty-five percent to use an integrated application release automation system. So some of you have matured up to that uh, highest level, uh, which is where most companies are trying to get to. Uh, and s several of us are still back there um, doing what we can with the CI CD process. So I, I, I think that you'll see that the, you know, automating these pieces, is, it, it, continuous deployment is as critical as automating continuous build and continuous test. So we're gonna um, look at, are you guys are still able to see my screen? Is it advancing? Yep, it's advancing. Okay. Thank you. So the tools you're going to need, we're going to show you how to use the GitHub repository uh, for the issue tracking and, and keeping track of the, the, the artifacts to be deployed and Deploy Hub for doing the release packaging and the, um, the, and the actual release process. We're going to keep it down to two simple steps. The first step, what you do is you create a, a Deploy Hub application package using components. Now, in the Deploy Hub world, an um, application is made up of multiple components. Those components are mapped um, to uh, the, Git, the GitHub repository um, at the artifact level and at the issue level. So it, you're, you're mapping first your, your assets, your, Git, your GitHub release assets to a Deploy Hub component. So that makes your first connection. The second step you're going to do is create a, a, a pipeline project. 
So you're going to use your GitHub project to control the deployments across the pipeline, but you're going to package the deployment in um, a Deploy Hub application. So for example, a, a Deploy Hub uh, application package might contain two components, a Tomcat uh, web app runner and an uptime uh, war file. Now, you could include also other uh, parts of that application, like the database, for example. If you had database changes, that would be a component. If you need to install Tomcat, you could actually call on Ansible, or uh, which we integrate with, or Puppet to actually, or Chef to install Tomcat. And what the pipeline project will do is help manage the approvals for the deployments. It'll record a full audit history so you have a, that, the ability to have a loop and have visibility for your production teams. It'll consolidate all these deployment activities so they're in one place and they're actually versioned. And they're going to link deployment components back to a change request. And what that's going to do is give us a full, a full loop um, so that everybody can stay in, um, in the loop, so to speak. Now the results will be a wiki, the wiki issues are gonna be linked to your deployment. So you'll be able to go into your, your, your actual uh, issue and you'll be able to see if it's been deployed and where it's been deployed to. And all that information is hyperlinked for easy viewing. So you can actually look at a change request and, and determine what deployment that change request was a part of and uh, be able to drive down and actually see what, 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 where that deployment might have been and how far across the pipeline it, it, it got to. So what you're ending up with is a full loop, starting with being able to create those uh, GitHub webhooks that, that tells Deploy Hub to check the approval status and records any corresponding approval in Deploy Hub. Um, it's going to go down through that uh, the approval process. So Deploy Hub would move a package, the application package with all those components, um, from a development environment into a test environment, execute that deployment with any post action. For example, you might have a post action to run test automation, and then notify everybody on, on success, in particular production. At that point, production can um, approve it and move the package up the, to the production state execute the production and execute any post action. And we have customers who oftentimes like to do a smoke test in production. Um, now, keep in mind that for most of this, it's going, it, it can be managed by the development team or your site re reliability engineer. Uh, the, the whole idea of shifting left means that developers have a tool that production and testing teams can have visibility into and have some control if they need to. And that's, that's what the Deploy Hub GitHub combination offers. So the, again, what, what we end up with is de, with GitHub and DeployHub having all the information in them. Uh, so you can go to that wiki page and centralize what that continuo, continuous loop look like from the uh, initial approval and the, and the check-in all the way to the production deployment. And all the actions are, are recorded in both lo locations, the DeployHub actions, the build logs, the test results, and all the change requests. On the Deploy Hub side, you're going to get a full continuous feedback loop as well, which shows you um, all the way back to the source uh, and the git commit, what build job. Uh, uh, if, they, if you're using a CI server like Jenkins, you might bring a build job forward. Um, the issue number associated to the application components, the application package, all the way to the environment and the endpoints in the environment. So now you, you actually have the ability to say, I know I committed my code, I know we did a build, but did it ever get to production? And this provides that full loop. Now, the loop's not just important to developers, it's important to the production teams. Because what the production teams want is not necessarily the responsibility of doing the deployments. What they want is the, the, the information and the visibility into what's occurring. And they also want some level of control. We did, we're not talking about it today, but calendars can provide them additional uh, security and control around the process, but we're really talking about the open source version. Um, and in the open source version, they, the production team has the full visibility into what they need to know about that, that release that went forward. Uh, in back inside, if we go back to the to the GitHub wiki, uh, we can see the, all the the feedback loop logs. So you can see everything that occurred for that for that entire process, from the beginning of the pipeline all the way back to the beginning of the pipeline, when the changes are done again. So just a couple of uh, points: what we used, we used webhooks for triggering events. Um, we used what we call releases for managing artifacts. 
We use the GitHub Wiki for documentation. We use the GitHub uh, Enterprise Security Model for locking down who can do what and for auditing of who did what and when. On the Deploy Hub side, we deployed by those events. Um, we, we used application packaging for components. Uh, we used our, what we have internally in our continuous deployment pipeline, and we used some pre and post deployment actions. We used the Git uh, repo for pulling the artifacts, and we did our own versioning control in that process. So just to, since some of you may not know what Deploy Hub is, it's an agentless continuous deployment solution. It has an open source um, uh, base to it uh, that can do what we just uh, talked about. Uh, what, why it's important is because it allows developers to declare their configurations of their application package, including database and infrastructure. And it also allows it, the, the, the application package to be pushed or pulled, so you can have a push methodology in the, as you would in a continuous delivery or an on-demand pull if you chose to do that. Uh, and it can track to any kind of target, physical, containers, vi uh, virtual. Um, my, these, this, this topic is going to become more and more important as we go to microservices and what's running on a microservice. And it has an agentless architecture, so it's super easy to install and implement, and it doesn't impact or um, it's, it's non-invasive when it comes to the production environment. You're not having to ask your production team to install agents in order to make it work. Another important part that, you know, is a selling point as a developer to get this moving forward to the production team is it does have a back-end version control database, not to version the code coming out of GitHub, of course, but to version the package itself. So once you declare your package all the way down to the logic required to do the install for any particular component or an update to a of environment variable or a change to a Cisco request router, all of that stuff is kept in one package. And any changes made to it, no matter how small, is recorded. Um, it, Personally, I think it's the most interesting part of our product because it does provide the ability to do version jumping. So for example, if you've got production is back six or seven versions and you need to get them up to speed, up to the most recent version, it's gonna do that for you, but it's gonna do it incrementally, even pulling all of the database pieces and any of the environment variable pieces along with it. As I said, uh, you don't have to go out and get budget authority for using Deploy Hub to do your continuous deployments. We saw that there was a gap in the, in the open source tooling for doing continuous delivery and continuous um, deployment. So we stuffed that with Deploy Hub. Uh, it competes um, extremely well against the big players. And we have been recognized in the, um, the Gartner Magic Quadrants two years in a row. And we continue to move uh, to, the, to the east and to the north, which is the direction you want to go. And if you want more information, you can uh, join the community. You can go to deployup.org. Um, and this, there is a full demo of what we just talked about. And you can find that at um, openmakesoftware.com. And on that note, I think I will uh, leave it open for questions. Yeah, Tracy, I'm back. I'm sorry. I have to apologize. Everybody. I had some mic problems. But That's we're okay. fixing. So I sort of left you hang, and Deb picked up the poll question. So thank you, Deb. But anyway, we have some questions, and let's start because we have a lot of time. So this is going to be real interesting. We really get, we can dig into this. Um, how does the whole process? How do you start it? How do you kick it off? What's the best way to go about this, Tracy? Well, I'm going to leave that one to, for Christian. So there's a. Um... That's a really good question. So there's a couple of ways that we can approach this, right? Um, I'll, I'll talk about the more traditionally sort of thought about way in terms of how you can sort of kick off an automated pipeline. And I'll, th I'll then I'll move into sort of the GitHub recommended way and then the way we do it actually as well. So the most common way that when we think about these like pipelines is um, we tend to think of it in like a polling situation, right? I have a canonical source code management server. It can be Git, it can be Subversion, it can be ClearCase. And traditionally what most organizations I've seen done, what I've seen in my experience is before they even think about modernizing, they tend to uh, have a build process that will then query uh, the source code server for changes, right? Um, 
this becomes very inefficient because then essentially what happens is you start scheduling everything and you're sort of dependent on that scheduling to have your builds uh, uh, happen. In this process and what Tracy and I have shown and how we actually do our internal builds at GitHub as well, is everything is API and webhook driven, meaning that in the scope of our pull request or it can even be as granular as the individual commit, uh, we're actually kicking off builds every time somebody commits to the repository. Now that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that you have to do that, but with the flexibility of our webhook platform, uh, you can trigger events uh, uh, very commonly. So like, yeah, for example, when we're getting ready to do a deployment uh, internally at GitHub, uh, we have like a, a series of about 20 checks that go through and uh, they do that uh, individually per commit to make sure that everything is up and running. Uh, Tracy, in your experience, what have you seen and how do you guys uh, recommend? Well, there's a there's a point in a, the life of continuous delivery that we become um, important. So for the most part, what we see is that you, you, the customer has gone through what you've just described, and they believe that they have a they are at a point in a maturity level across the organization that they're really ready to start mastering what I call Agile's last mile, which is getting things all the way to production. Once that yeah. occurs, the next step is to really start defining um, the application packaging process. It's important to get the application packaging down because that's what you want to be able to version and it yeah. needs to have some automation behind it. So once they've get, gotten to a certain level of maturity in their continuous delivery, and they're probably doing continuous to build, and they're doing their you know, check-in and compile, which is continuous integration, and they're doing the, the, auto, the automated builds, and they're starting to do automated tests, the continuous deployment uh, question becomes important. And at that point, you have to decide where you what's going to drive it. In the demo that we just, uh, examples we just uh, provided, uh, GitHub would be driving the process, but you could also drive it with something like a Jenkins CI process or yep. uh, Bamboo or any of the any common CI server that you might have. Yeah, and then uh, one thing I wanted to note, because I think this is something that I always uh, hear in terms of objections from uh, software development organizations that are coming from legacy tooling or legacy processes. Um, a lot of times, they uh, a lot of customers will see this uh, sort of process, like something like GitHub and OpenMake, and we always do a lot of demonstrations around web applications or uh, uh, like Tomcat servers or like even GitHub where, uh, you know, I like to describe where a, a Ruby on Rails app on absolute steroids, right? Um, so a lot of times, uh, a lot of organizations will get it in, in, um, in the mindset that they think this is only for like web application development or modern software development technologies. And uh, the answer, my, my rebuttal to that is we've seen and not only are these tools agnostic, but we've seen uh, uh, successes in just about any sort of industry in any vertical. So, uh, you know, I think a really good uh, example of this is uh, BMW is one of our uh, enterprise customers in uh, based out of Germany. And I think we all know who BMW is. They've got great cars. Um, they started their GitHub enterprise journey because of the uh, 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 lack of great software that was built around their uh in Dash uh, entertainment systems, so they evolved onto that, and then they have eventually moved uh, the get their uh, enterprise their enterprise software delivery uh, practice with GitHub and other tools uh, into GitHub itself. So now they're doing all their embedded development and everything uh, around every other piece of the car is actually being done in that process. So it, it's really about finding like uh, uh, not only migrating your SCM tools, but it's also about fitting your build tools and your delivery tools into this process as well. And uh, I would say it's not impossible. I've seen a, a lot of success with it, so. Wow, so thank you very much to both. You had quite the answer. I, another yeah. <laughs> question, How, I, I assume this for you, Chris. How can you manage a database as a part of this process? So that's that, a, that's a. I'll take ahead, that, Tracy. yeah, I'll oh, take Tracy, that. You'll take it. I'm, yeah. I'm batting a zero here. I'm trying to go. It's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Um, so on the database side, uh, we get that question a lot. Um, a database is just another component in the mind of Deploy Hub. So we talked about what an application is. An application is a collection of components. And when you define your application package, you would, you would define a, let's say, a PSQL statement as one of your components. And that, um, that, that SQL statement might add a table, for example, to roll forward or it might uh, delete that table on a rollback. 
So when you're managing database components, you're actually adding them as a component to the application package. And that component has an a activity associated to it that actually does what that component needs. And that's how we do it. And so it just becomes another part of the application package. It can move forward or move back or be checked into the backend version control database to be checked out and applied at some future date in a, in a version jump forward or back. Okay, thanks. Now, I'm not even going to guess this time. How, how do I know when the issue has been closed and what environment it has been installed to? I think I'll give that to Christian. And I was going to pick yeah. him. <laughs> <laughs> it's an issue, no right? <laughs> It's an issue, right? So what, what we're doing what, uh, with what Tracy showed and, and what we sort of have is an extensible platform that can uh, sort of set up the, uh, the, the granularity and the level of reporting that you want. So in Tracy's example, uh, all of the issues are being linked back in a wiki referencing the issue that it's coming from. So the way that we key that up is based on the shock commit number that we're building or releasing off of. So Tracy takes that information from our webhooks and essentially takes that JSON payload and will then report back to the wiki. Now, the nice thing about that is because of those webhooks and the amount of information that we give you, it doesn't just stop at maybe putting it in the wiki. It's really uh, up to you on how you want to build this process. So if you want to be super automated, a very common use case would be uh, once I have a deployment out, then I can essentially via the API uh, close out an issue or merge a pull request back into master if I want to as well. Um, I would highly suggest uh, for the person who asked this question to take a look at our API and see how flexible it is and the amount of data that it will give back to you uh, because I, uh, the world is essentially your oyster with this um, in terms of what you can do in terms of building automation. Uh, I've seen a lot of organizations uh, go automated all the way to QA, but still want to have a, a, a manual workflow from UA to product, UAT to production. But I've also seen uh, like what we do at GitHub, we're fully automated all the way to production as well. Uh, and it's because of our API and our webhooks that really allow for that flexibility and that freedom for your organization to make the choice on how much automation that you want in there as well. And then Deploy Hub allows you uh, that freedom or that safety net to be automated, but still have an application and a, a platform like uh, Deploy Hub to uh, give you that safety and security at the same time. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just you know em emphasize that what's happening is that you have these application components and those components um, are associated back to uh, GitHub through change requests or issue number. And that's associated yeah. back to your commit and your source. So we're yeah. using those webhooks to, to complete that picture because we have what we would call the backstream information and uh, GitHub has the front stream information. And we're pulling that together through those webhooks. Yep. And we, oh. uh, and for those unfamiliar with Git, and I'll just add like 12, 15 seconds on this. For those unfamiliar with Git, um, we are not, like Git itself is not like a, uh, a time-based or a, uh, a file-based uh, version control system. It all goes back to what we call the SHA string. So every, every commit essentially is uh, encoded into a, a, a non-linear string, and that's how we're providing all that traceability and all that uh, feedback back to the Git server from Deploy Hub. Yep. Great, thanks. Um, we've been getting a lot of questions. There's apparently been some issues with viewing the slides. Uh, you know, understand all the slides will be available on DevOps.com, you know, sometime after the webinar within 24 hours. So you'll be able to get everything if you missed everything. I'm going to I'm going to take a shot today. This is Tracy. What platforms are supported? Well, both uh, GitHub and Deploy Hub are platform agnostic. So if you wanted to support, I mean, in terms of doing deployments, because there's no agent required, we can deploy to just about any environment, including, heaven forbid, yes, the mainframe, iSeries, um, and like I said earlier, even a even a, a Cisco request router if you needed to. And on the GitHub side, it's agnostic to, to platform. So you can, uh, these are, what I would consider true enterprise tools that they're not built for a particular um, a particular tool. They're built for the enterprise and what the enterprise might run into in terms of platforms and and different languages and uh, environments that they're working in. Yeah, we right. uh, yeah Go we ahead. Tend, for for GitHub itself, we 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 tend to we have a very we have an opinion on how software should be 
uh, should be done in terms of workflow. You know, we talk about Git flow and GitHub flow, but um, ultimately it's up to the enterprise organization to take that opinion and then see if it, you know, gels with how they're currently doing work. And if it doesn't, GitHub itself is flexible enough to meet any sort of workflow requirement. And now really taking off on that question a little bit, do you integrate with Alassian, Jira, and Confluence? Absolutely, yes. 100%. Uh-huh. I knew neither the answer, but I wanted to be clear for him. Yeah, you know. neither side neither side cares. So um, again, those tools, keep in mind, uh, continuous integration tools like Jenkins and Bamboo, um, they themselves don't do anything, but they orchestrate. So they're not, they don't do compiles and they don't do deployments and they don't do version control and they don't do testing but they are a, a central point of control to run a workflow that may call all of those tools. Yep. And there is oftentimes a, a confusion about Deploy Hub competing with uh, Jenkins. And I want to kill that immediately uh, because Jenkins is not ever going to want to try to manage a application package. It's going to call other tools to do that. And what most people do is they write their own deployment process, and then you hear, well, Jenkins is doing my deployments. Well, not really. Some unsung hero who wrote that script is actually doing your deployments. <laughs> uh, so, so yes, the, these tools fit within any of your CI, CD processes uh, from, from the beginning to the end of what you saw today. You could have that driven by any, any of the CI tools. Yep, and then I will say from the GitHub side, uh, GitHub and Jira is probably the most common integration that I see outside of GitHub and Jenkins, right? Um, there are uh, support for smart commits, you can do transitions, you can do time-based tracking, and it's all built on the uh, commit mapping uh, that you'll set up on the Jira side. And that plugin's available in the marketplace It has full support for GitHub and GitHub Enterprise. And then there is a Confluence plugin as well. So if you're already invested in the uh, Atlassian ecosystem a bit, hopefully you're not using Bitbucket. That's okay if you are. Um, then there is support for that as well. So, yep. Okay, Chris, I have one for you. What's the difference between GitHub and Bitbucket? Oh, that's a great question. So, I know, uh, I so it's actually, uh, oh, that's a good question. How do I want to take that? Because I've got like 12 different answers, right? So do we have three hours? Because I could certainly talk to you. Well, we got a little time. Pick All three right. <laughs> so I think I want to elevate the conversation a little bit. So in terms of what we think about in terms of source code management, GitHub and Bitbucket are very similar, right? So Bitbucket is a source code management utility that was originally written on Mercurial uh, when it was Stash, but now it's Git-based when it now, as it's now known as Bitbucket. But I think, you know, in terms of where you see the core differentiator, is when you look at Bitbucket in terms of its UI and its UX, and I highly encourage you to take a look at this if you've never seen it before. Uh, we, we always want you to check out our competitors because we're usually a little bit better. Um, Atlassian tends to take the bigger uh, project focus, right? They want to get everybody involved in the process and uh, they really de designed their UX with Bitbucket around sort of the project manager level. So if you look at how you navigate and how your pull requests look in GitHub, it's really designed for the project manager to have visibility into that process. Uh, if you look at GitHub, we take a developer first, best of breed approach uh, that is not necessarily designed around one ecosystem or one platform and is really centered on the developer experience. There's something internally that we talk about. One of our design philosophies when it comes to actually developing our platform uh, is this idea around developer happiness or what we call like, uh, what we'd like to call developer love as well. And I know that sounds a little uh, 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 hippie a little bit, um, but it's really about knowing that developers uh, work really well when they have tools that really uh, that kind of get out of their way, right? Developers, when they're using GitHub, don't really have to think about the tool. It's just something that's there. And there are all these little things that sort of add up that build efficiency. Uh, one of the most common, com uh, 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 one, some of the most common feedback that I get from developers on Bitbucket is that it looks like Jira and it feels like Jira and it, it's used like Jira. There are complex permissioning models. Uh, the servers uh, themselves are not very performant. And uh, even uh, some, of the, some of the feedback that I've received from my customers when they've worked with Atlassian is that they feel Atlassian's just not investing a whole lot into the platform. Bitbucket, Bitbucket being an SEM tool that they have, but their big uh, investment is in uh, you know, more at what they consider enterprise grade tools like Jira and Confluence. So GitHub is our product. It's what we go to market with uh, and we put 100% of our effort into it. So that's sort of uh, my take on it. 
Okay, uh, let's keep going. There's some great questions here. How do you handle deployment failures? I'll great take question. that one. I'll, yeah, yeah. Go for it, Tracy. I'll take that one. So deployment failures are um, a bummer. They happen. Um, much, much of the reasons why they happen is it, because there the, there's scripts back there that are that's doing work, and it's hard to see what um, occurred. So in Deploy Hub, you have some options. Um, you can continue moving forward, um, which is sort of a habit that we've have gotten into in the continuous integration world, or you can jump forward or back. So you can do an immediate rollback should you need to, even if that means you have to bring in environment variables and database updates, uh, and you can, um, or you can jump it forward. So you can apply a fix and then jump it forward. Now keep in mind that the, the difference between when you have an automation tool and a scripted uh, environment is that there's some visibility into the process and you can see what's changed between those two, um, uh, those two deployments. So if you are trying to sort out why your deployment failed, you can quickly look to see what was changed from the last time, and you know probably that's what caused the problem. So you can actually apply the fix and then move that forward, because now once you've applied the fix, you have a new version and you push that new version forward, or you can just do a rollback. Either, either way is available. And, like, and I really want to emphasize, because we have that back-end version control engine that, that, ver that treats the entire application package like code, uh, and it p packages everything, it, it versions the entire package knowing everything that occurred to that package. It makes it super easy to make a fix or to um, roll back. Yep. And then from our side, from the SCM side, uh, it, it starts and it, it starts with branch protections, right? So essentially when we're opening up pull requests, we need to be by default, you know, 100% of the time, I always recommend that you start protecting master, your master branch as a, a branch that should not have force pushing and then doubling down on that with things like required statuses and uh, branch permissioning that not only control who can merge to a branch, but also if your deployment fails, OpenMate can send a signal back to GitHub that says, hey, this failed, perhaps we should block this pull request from being merged back into master until we figure out what's happening, right? Yeah. Okay, let's, since we're on deployment, let me take off with another question. How does Kubernetes fit into your deployment process? I love that question because the more we get into um, th these containers and microservice environments, the more important it's going to be to start automating the, the um, application package management. So Kubernetes is treated just like anything else. So we treat containers in the same way as we treat any endpoint. Keep in mind, we don't have to have an agent out there so that an agent isn't, um, isn't required to be on your container prior to doing a deployment. Uh, the other thing that we are, are, are that we do is because we have that backend version control piece, we can determine where uh, a where versions of of components are installed in what containers. So the the farther down the road you go into the Kubernetes world and you start using microservices, you're gonna you're gonna explode your number of endpoints. Literally, it's it's gonna explode. And keeping track of who's actually running one of those, uh, a, a particular microservice, who's actually using it, if you have people connecting to it, all of that information is going to begin be becoming more and more important. Um, and in our future roadmap, we're going to start building out those kinds of features because we already know what component is going to be installed on what microservice. And what we should be able to do as well is to provide to you if anybody's using that microservice. So the Kubernetes um, uh, environment is, is going to be extremely important as we move forward, and we already do support the containers. We just joined the um, Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation uh, so that we have a, a, can have closer conversations with the, the Kubernetes folks. And we will be looking at uh, integrating into Helm. So Helm is a Kubernetes uh, uh, point A to point B uh, deployment solution, and it uses something called charts. And what we will be able to do is potentially generate those charts with our application packaging so that you have all of that information um, ready to be pushed out by Helm. So we're very excited about Kubernetes. We currently support um, containers, and we're going to be building more features around management of, of microservices from who's using what. Yep. And then I would say to add on to that, because like Tracy said, it's all just being treated as code. Uh, essentially, you can take two strategies around uh, the sort of composition and the deployment of those orchestrators, right? You can 
uh, the most common way and probably the most uh, 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 useful way is you treat those, um, you basically have those those com composition files, those orchestration files live within your project. So if you have a repository, many times you'll have either like a .compose folder or a .github folder that takes all of those like uh, uh, infrastructure and composition specific files and you put it in its own isolated environment. Or uh, less commonly, but also equally useful, is having uh, a separate project that controls all of that orchestration and then using uh, a webhook to sort of manage all of that flow as well. It's just depending on how you want to organize it. The most common I see though, and, and especially if you want to get into a, sort of a microservices uh, uh, first approach, is keeping it at the uh, repository level. Yeah. That's great. Let's take it to a little something here for somebody had a question regarding Microsoft. How well does this solution work with Microsoft MVC servers? Uh, what, what kind of server, I'm sorry? MVC. Oh, like, like a model view controller, like a, like a yeah. .NET sort of, and I, oh, yes, uh, kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. 100%. Um, our partnership with Microsoft is only strengthening day by day. Uh, so not only can you sort of deploy any sort of MVC framework application, I mean, that's what Ruby on Rails is. Um, th these work fairly, very seamlessly. Um, I think you know Microsoft, especially with our relationship with them as, as it's uh, evolved, they are getting more and more focused on not only the open source, but on uh, the modern uh, platform as well. So uh, we've had a chance to talk uh, extensively with Microsoft and some of the stuff that they're working on that you'll see later, probably in this coming year and the next, I think is gonna be very exciting and it's only gonna tighten that integration in terms of supporting the entire Microsoft platform. They've put a lot of money and investment into Azure and I think you'll see a lot of that. But if you're using other uh, like on-prem tools like IIS to deploy your .NET applications, uh, today there's 100% support for that, yep. And that's on, both, that's on both sides, it's on the Deploy Hub side as well. Deploy Hub yep. um, fully supports the Windows environment. Yep. It's that's great. I got a few more. Do you support Haskell and CI for Nix projects? Haskell and uh, yeah. So hey. Haskell being, I'm going to assume it's, uh, we're, we're referring to Haskell as sort of the functional programming language. That's the only one I'm aware of. That's the one I'm aware and, of as well. So yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't hear the CI part of that question, but I'll take and it to my Haskell. See, Haskell well, just say, enough. do you support Haskell and CI for Nix projects? NIX, I mean, uh, it's like StarNix, yeah, like yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that's probably where Git sort of got its start. It got its start was in a, you know, when when uh, Linus wrote it, uh, it was more uh, a tool geared geared and optimized for at that time for uh, the Nix community, right? Uh, so yeah, one hundred percent, answers yes. And that's really, I mean, uh, I think we've covered all the questions, except for a couple, maybe if I'd ask your question, I feel it was answered by seeing another question. I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Thank Tracy and Chris. And if you want to learn more about this, go to openmakesoftware.com. Tracy, do you have any closing comments? Uh, no, I don't think so. I just want to thank uh, uh, Chris and uh, GitHub for uh, doing this webinar with us. It's been great to work with the team. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for putting up with our little technical difficulties throughout this webinar. But I see most of you stayed on, so we really appreciate it. And thank you for attending another webinar and have a good rest of your day or evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.